Hello and welcome to question 3. In this question, our sample data is summarized in sigma notation form. This is something that appears in exam questions very often. We'll look at how to deal with this. More importantly, what does it actually mean? Because understanding what it means would result in higher knowledge retention. As usual, let's start with step 0. Let's ask ourselves a few questions. Firstly, is my population normally distributed? Yes. Do I know the population variance? That is also a yes. Other interesting numbers to take note of, the claimed population mean of 1.5 liters, sample size of 40. You might realize that we are not given the observed sample mean, and that's because you have to work it out from the summarized data over here. So let's write it down in pencil. So now we have to work out what is X bar, the observed sample mean. You might also notice something new that we have not seen in question one and two. That is the sample variance. Good news is we don't need the sample variance in this question because we have the population variance. You can think of it this way. The population variance is like your graphing calculator. The sample variance is like your secondary school Casio calculator. If you had a graphing calculator, you don't really need your Casio calculator. But if you don't have your graphing calculator, you will try your best with the Casio calculator. But you also know that the Casio calculator is not enough to answer questions in the H2 maths syllabus. With that aside, let's look at how we can work out the observed sample mean. To work out the observed sample mean, we have to look at just the first part of the summarized data given to us. To explain what this means, maybe a picture will speak a thousand words. Imagine if I have 40 bottles, and in pink is their actual volume. First bottle is 1.4 liters, so on and so forth. You might notice that we have a plus 0.1 here. What does it mean? When we measure the volume, maybe due to some equipment error, instead of measuring 1.4, we measure 1.5. A 0.1 was unintentionally added on. And when we add up all these measured values, this is equal to 63 liters. First, when we divide by 40 on the left hand side, you're going to get our x bar because that's actually what we want x1 plus x2 all the way to x40 and divide by 40. And from the yellow rectangle, that's 40, 0 0.1, divide by 40. So that is 0 0.1. Our x bar is very simply just 63 over 40 minus 0 0.1. And this value happens to be 1.475. Next. We need to define x and also mu. With the definitions done, we are now ready to move to step one. In step one, we have to write down our two hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that the population mean is what it is claimed to be, 1.5 liters. And the alternate hypothesis is the population mean actually is lesser than 1.5 liters. We're going to do this test at a 1% level of significance. So now we have all the information we need on the full scat paper. It's time to do step two. In step two, we have to begin the test by first assuming that the population mean is indeed 1.5 liters. If that is the case, then our sampling mean would also have a mean of 1.5 liters. The variance of our sampling distribution would be reduced to 0.01 divided by 40. In order to carry out the z-test, let's convert our x-bar variable into a z-variable. To convert our x-bar variable into the standard normal variable, we take x-bar, which means all the possible sample means, and subtract all of them by 1.5. We need to divide by the standard deviation of our sampling distribution, which will be the square root of 0.01 over 40. Let's move on to step 3a. How can we conduct the test using the observed test statistic and the critical region? In order to work out our observed test statistic z, we have to take our observed sample mean, 1.475, and we subtract it by the alleged population mean, 1.5, and we divide by square root of 0 0.01 divided by 40. This is our test statistic, Z. Next, we want to find out where is the cutoff point for 0 0.01. To work out the Z critical value, we have to use our inverse norm function in our graphing calculator. Make sure you input these values in, and you get this value. Now, let's do a sketch to see whether or not to reject H0. So from the sketch over here, you can see our observed test statistic is about 1.58 standard deviations to the left of the mean. Our critical region is about 2.33 standard deviations from the mean and beyond, which means our test statistic is not inside the critical region. Therefore, we will not reject H0. Let's take a look at step 3b. How can we conduct the same test using our graphing calculator? Welcome back to step 3b. These are the values you should be putting into your graphing calculator under Z test. When you press enter, this is what you should get, the P value and also the Z value. I'm going to show you how to get the P value from MF26. So just in case, for whatever reason, you do not have your graphing calculator with you, you could still work out what the P value is. After all, the P value is nothing but area under the graph. Recall that the observed test statistic is negative 1.581. Let's first look down this column to find 1.5 and it is on this row. So I'm going to highlight this whole row for 1.5 for 8 because our test statistic is 1.58 so the value that I want 0 0.9429 oh I realized the graphing calculator is in the way this is the intersection of 1.5 
and 8. Now to get 1.581, I need to add 1 to this value, which will be 0 0.9430. Remember that 0 0.9430 will be the area under the graph here if z was 1.581. But our value is negative 1.581. So what I want to do is take 1 minus 0 0.9430. That will give me 0 0.0570. So let's compare 0 0.0570 with what we have in our graphing calculator. And yes, you find that the p-value is roughly 0 0.0. 570. So that's how you can use your MF26 to work out the p-value if you really wanted to. Now let's take a look at how we can conclude this question. So in conclusion, depending on whether you use step 3a or 3b, you have to write down these statements and of course remember to answer the context of the question with a second sentence. And this is how we do question 3. Stay tuned for question 4 because we're going to do question 3 all over again but this time we're going to pretend we don't know the population variance. We'll take a look with a side-by-side -side comparison, what has changed, what are the things that we need to look out for. So I'll see you in the next one.